And so it says that he took his and tore his old mantle in two pieces. Then he took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. He went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah, which had fallen from him, and he struck the water. And he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, it was divided this way and that way. And Elisha crossed over on dry ground. Now I want to point something out. Elijah's last miracle was Elisha's first miracle. Remember, Elisha's, Elijah's last miracle was he struck the water. The water parted. They walked over on dry ground. Elisha's first miracle was he struck the water. The water parted and he walked over on dry ground. You know what he was signifying? He was saying, I am picking up where Elijah left off. Now, let me bring this home for us to understand what God's saying to us today. Elijah, Elijah went up and his mantle came down. When Jesus went up, Acts chapter 1, he told his disciples, I'm getting ready to go away. Go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. Because you're going to receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. You're going to receive dunamis, power to be my witnesses. So when Jesus came up, his mantle came down. We call him Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit mantle that covers our lives is so far greater than anything that Elijah or Elisha ever walked in. What we've been given in the New Testament is so much more powerful than what we point back to in the Old Testament. And just like when Elijah went up and, he, and his mantle came down and Elisha picked up where Elijah left off, I'm telling you what Jesus was saying to us is, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to you so that you can pick up where I leave off. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it this way, greater things than I do, you're going to do. Because I go to my father. That's what I'm saying. Go back and read all the things that Jesus did. And he says, greater things we're going to do. Jesus did crazy stuff. He spoke to the winds and waves and said, peace be still. Come on. His disciples needed to pay their taxes. I'm not going to say how many still need to pay their taxes. But you know what he told them? Go fishing. And they caught a fish with a coin in its mouth. Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. But I'm telling you that this is a season that Jesus is saying greater things. So, Elisha takes this mantle up. He crosses over on dry grounds. And I just want to show you the first thing that he does with this double portion mantle. He not, does not go parading back into the city to say, look at me. I got Elijah's mantle. Look how special I am. I am the chosen one. You know, they, there was a school of the prophets there. But when he walked back into the city, he was wearing this mantle. And he used the double portion anointing, not just for personal breakthrough, but to change a city. How many believe that God still wants to change cities today? And so let's, let's look at that part of the story. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Please notice, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees. But the water is bad and the ground is barren. Now let me just say this. Is that when he, when he took up that mantle, and when we are taking up the mantle of the Holy Spirit on our life, we have to understand we are now mantled for breakthrough. We are mantled for breakthrough. You say, what is breakthrough? When you've got a resisting, opposing force that wants to keep you, keep you sad, wants to keep you broke, wants to keep you depressed, wants to keep you in strife, it wants to keep you fearful. Come on, there's an opposing force that wants to oppose everything that God wants to do in your life. But God is saying, I am mantling you for breakthrough. Now, let's look at this definition of this word breakthrough, because we use it a lot in our kind of circles. But I want you to understand what we're actually saying. 
Because Webster's definition of the word breakthrough is that it is a military movement or advance all the way through and beyond the enemy's frontline defense. Everybody say through and beyond. It is the overcoming of a stalemate and every obstacle barrier and hindrance to progress. And so here's where we've been at the church. We believe God when we have a need and we receive the breakthrough for our need, but then we never go beyond. Your breakthrough is only the beginning of you bringing breakthrough everywhere you go. Years ago, we were thinking about this concept and we looked at the, uh, the invasion of the beaches of Normandy during World War II. How many know that the Germans had taken over most of continental Europe? They were a stronghold over that land. But on, uh, but on, on D-Day, all the Allied forces came ashore and at great cost to American life and Allied lives, th those, those young men stormed the beaches at Normandy and, uh, and they actually had a day of breakthrough. Is that true? They broke through the enemy's front line defense on the beaches of Normandy. But at the end of that day, they did not stick their rifles in the ground and stop and have a party. Why? Because the goal wasn't to break through. The goal was to go beyond. Right? There were cities that needed to be changed, nations that needed to be liberated, people that needed to be set free. But here we are in the church, and we understand this concept of breaking through, but we've not yet grasped the concept of going beyond. In other words, when you pray and you get a healing, that's your breakthrough, but now you ought to be turning around and praying for everybody that you meet to begin to release the beyond of that breakthrough. Come on, through and beyond. We carry a mantle of breakthrough. You're anointed to break through, but also to go beyond. So the men of the city come to Elisha and they say, please notice the situation. The city is pleasant. Looks like a beautiful city as my Lord sees, but the water's bad and the ground is barren. What they were saying to him is the water is poisonous. Our flocks are dying. Our crops are dying. There's a curse in the ground. That's literally what that, that barrenness word actually means. It indicates a curse. Look what happens. And he said to him, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. And I'm going to tell you what, what this is all about. Elisha was now wearing this double portion mantle. He had a spirit of revelation. See, the city they're talking about was the city of Jericho. And Jericho, remember, way back in the book of Joshua, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Y'all know that song, right? Okay, well, after the, the great victory at Jericho, uh, Joshua actually pronounced a prophetic decree and said, Cursed is he who rebuilds this city, for he will, re he will lay the foundation with the blood of his oldest, and he will set the gate on the blood of his youngest. Which didn't make much sense if you're reading it in Joshua. But fast forward to the days of Ahab and Jezebel. And a man rose up um, and basically shook his fist in the face of God and said, I'm going to rebuild Jericho. And when he rebuilt Jericho, according to the pagan culture of the day, he took, he laid the foundation stone of rebuilding the city by following the pagan culture and took his oldest son, slit his throat and poured the blood into the cornerstone. Then when he set the gate, he slit the throat of his youngest son and poured his blood into the foundation of the gate. Come on, how many know God hates the shedding of innocent blood? And yet, it, so it caused a curse to come in this city. The water was bad, the water was poison, and the ground was cursed. And Elisha was able to discern the source of the curse by revelation. He was able to not just look at the, the beauty of the surroundings or, the, or the, the prettiness of the city, but he was saying, you know what, there's a curse operating here and we're going to break it. I want you to understand something, guys. Inside of you is curse-destroying, yoke-breaking anointing. 
And we see this in the next thing that he does. He says, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought him, so they brought it to him. He went out to the source of the water, or if you will, the source where the curse was operating, and he cast the salt in there. Here's what we have to understand. God's going to give us revelation, but then out of that, he's going to bring a mobilization to the church, to the ecclesia, to understand that if a curse is going to be broken, it's going to be because we break it. 